Well, good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's fireside chat, uh, Ukraine eHealth, working towards health sector reform, uh, hosted by RTI International and the International Renaissance Foundation. My name is Victoria Timoshevska. I'm your moderator for today, and I'm the director of the public health program at IRF, where I oversee projects in public health spending, access to medicines and health services for marginalized population, human rights and healthcare, and health system strengthening portfolio. Uh, next slide, please. Throughout today's event, we will be offering both Ukrainian and English translations. You can access these translation services by clicking on the interpretation globe icon at your toolbar at the bottom of your screen. That will open a menu that allows you to set and select off English or Spanish, which actually stands for Ukrainian. For technical purposes, we will be using this channel labeled as Spanish for all the Ukrainian translations today. Our experienced translators have informed us that Zoom's interpretation actually sometimes does not work properly for all users when attempting to use a language which is not already standard in Zoom, such as Ukrainian. So in order to eliminate the potential issues, we've selected Spanish channel to listen to Ukrainian translations today. Our speakers today will be speaking in both English and Ukrainian. So if you're a listener who is fluent in both languages, then you may prefer to have your interpretation tool on off position that will allow you to hear the original and what is being said without the aid of the interpreter. If you're fluent only in English, please select English audio channel for the duration of this webinar. And if you're fluent only in Ukrainian, please select Spanish audio channel. If you have any issues using interpretation tool, let us know in the chat and our technical experts will assist you there. Uh, we will have both Ukrainian and English speakers monitoring the chat. Uh, today we will be discussing the e-health system in Ukraine, which is a critical component of Ukraine's health sector reform. Um, I will moderate the discussion with our panelists on Ukraine's progress in e-health thus far, remaining challenges and opportunity related to e-health governance, lessons learned from adapting and implementing e-health solutions and strategies. Um, next, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists today who have generously agreed to share their expertise and experiences with us today. Um, next slide, please. I would like to welcome Yaroslav Kuchir, um, who's the Deputy Minister of Health of Ukraine for Digital Development and Digital Transformation and Digitalization since June 2020. In 2017, he headed the first Ukrainian delegation of the Japanese government program, Ship of Young Leaders of the World. Previously, he served as an advisor to the Minister of Youth and Sports of Ukraine in 2016 to 2017 and advisor to the Kiev, to the head of the Kiev State Administration from 2014 to 2015. He has founded a large number um, of private commercial structures in Ukraine and in the EU in the fields of e-commerce, IT, and manufacturing. He holds a master's degree in protection information with limited access and automation of its processing from the National Aviation University. Um, next speaker is Dmitro Chernish, who serves as the head of the Department for eHealth Development at the National Health Service of Ukraine and is an expert on public administration of digital transformation in Ukraine. Uh, from 2015 to 2018, he engaged in the process of public procurement reform and was part of the team that launched Prozoro, a hybrid electronic open source government e procurement system. Since 2018, he has been in charge of eHealth development within NHSU and implementation it in Ukraine. eHealth is a two component electronic system that benefits over 31 million patients across uh, the country. Um, glad to introduce my next speaker, Alexander Kvitashvili, who is a former Minister of Health of Ukraine uh, from 2014 to 2016 and a Republic of Georgia from 2008 to 2010, where he led the process of comprehensive health care reform. Um, from 2010 to 2013, he was the rector of Tbilisi State University, the oldest and the largest higher education institution in Georgia. He is a consultant on health care management, health economics, and health finance to the World Health Organization, UNICEF, Kimonix International, Gresh, Gracio International Foundation, and other private state and international organizations. He holds a master's in science degree in public administration from Robert 
Wagner School of Public Service in New York University and a Bachelor of Arts in Modern History from Tbilisi State University. In 2012, Mr. Kvitashvili was awarded the Presidential Order of Excellence for his contribution to the healthcare reform in Georgia. And he's the Dr. Honoris Causa of Ilaya State University and University of Georgia. Um, my last speaker um, that I'm happy to present, uh, Rita Simbagvardwe, is an international health informatician with the Information and Communication Technology Group at RTI International. Uh, Mrs. Simbabja um, combined experience in public health and information technology in different parts of the world contributes to her strong understanding of the fundamentals of the health informatics. She has worked in countries including Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Laos, India, Bangladesh, US and US Pacific Islands. Her current work contributes to health information management system strengthening, chronic and infectious disease surveillance system development and implementation, innovative mobile health technology development and evaluation, research in electronic health records. Rita has also worked in the areas of quarantine border health monitoring and reporting of communicable diseases, comprehensive cancer control, hereditary cancer and emergency management in the academic nonprofit federal global health and private sectors. Uh, next slide, please. Today's entire event will be devoted to discussion. So we welcome all of you um, to submit your questions at any time throughout today's discussion using the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen in your toolbar. And we'll try to get as many of your questions as we can. Um, the chat will be reserved for technical issues. So if you have any technical issues, please refer to the chat. Um, and our technical experts will assist you from there. Please note that we will remain the audience will remain muted throughout today's webinar, so Q&A um, function and chat feature will be best means to communicate with us today. So now I would like to kick off our discussion and um, with the first question to Mr. Kucher. Um, as Ukraine is in the midst of the second phase of the healthcare reform, what do you see as the primary priorities of the e-health system development? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's a big pleasure for me to take part in this, in this serious event. Uh, I believe that e-health and its development uh, undoubtedly one of the key instruments of our reform. Uh, we uh, do understand all responsibility related to its development for future sustainable operation. And um, I'm happy that our team was able to stabil uh, stabilize the work of e-health system, lay on foundation and including financial resources for its support uh, by the government. Because when we started a year ago, I, I cannot believe that we had a, such a terrible and hard situation. Of course, with the uh, support of our colleagues from uh, National Health Service of Ukraine, uh, we did a great job. Uh, of course, uh, I think for a success of the system uh, of among our population, it should become accessible for uh, public. Ra uh, rather than uh, medical staff only, because for now, a lot of medical staff knows about the health system, but uh, local people did not know how to use it, what, what, what is it about, and all the things that we can offer. Um, for this to happen, we are extending a number of services, for example, um, that, that, can give, uh, that can be offered exclusively from the e-health meaning the services which cannot be assessed without a health system, without the medical information system and other things. Uh, for example, uh, now a lot of people know about the health because uh, we have a service like, for example, like um, first uh, medical conclusion about uh, childbirth. So the people can get their uh, birth certificate the first document of the child from the e-health system and, met, and, uh, and from that uh, a store, medical story of patient of this uh, newborn is stored in health. Uh, we started vaccination waiting list, uh, which is also available through uh, using a DM mobile application, uh, which um, will then turn in health to obtain a digital vaccination certificate from the DA application. So now you can get to your waiting list we store, uh, you get on time on your vaccination and we store on or, or, all of the information in the health system. And after that, you can get your certificate and maybe go travel. But we are not thinking about uh, travelers because we know the 
uh, full amount of uh, passports that uh, people get to travel abroad. Uh, we're thinking about uh, reopening the country with this certificate and promote vaccination in the Ukraine. So um, our next project that we are working about, it's uh, uh, in a few months, we plan to start a digital sick leave document, uh, which uh, will be available and uh, working only with the uh, e-health. Uh, this is convenient for sure, allow us to reduce our expenses from the State Insurance Foundation and to fight with uh, the things that you can buy this document right now online without any control. But uh, I want to mention the development of any additional functionality um, capacity complex. Uh, the problem is that the health system is a very closed system. Uh, first, we cannot engage a big number of um, app developers, uh, big companies, because uh, not such a big pool of developers uh, wanted to be uh, uh, waiting in the line uh, to engage, to work with the government and pass uh, through the all uh, red tape. Uh, and second, unfortunately, um, the decision making process within the system development is very complicated. Um, and it requires a lot of um, anonymous decisions from a big amount of stakeholders. It's a huge problem for us because a lot of stakeholders are working on the health system, a lot of um, different opinions, and we try to manage all the thing. That's why we incited that the conception of uh, digital health, which was adopted by the cabinet uh, office, uh, cabinet of minister at the end of uh, of, this, uh, of, the, of the previous year. And it established an uh, architectural project team consisting of a small number of people uh, that will have the delegated authority to adopt all the decisions about the e-health uh, development. Uh, we think the, it's a not a so fast process to, to, to do these things, but uh, I'm, I'm happy that, that, that we started the thing and we plan to develop it with, uh, with our partners from NHSU. Thank you, Deputy Minister. That's indeed an incredible achievement. And I would like to follow up with my question to Dmitro. As a director of the Department of Health of the National Health Service Ukraine, outside of thinking about the complicate, complex um, architecture of the system, what do you think is the greatest success of the e-health system so far? And what would you name as the most significant governance challenges that are yet to be addressed? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to be here at this event. Uh, thank you, Victoria, for your question. Um, if you don't mind, I switch to Ukrainian, so please uh, turn up English interpretation. Um, so, if to speak about what was already achieved, the key achievements, we had within this very period uh, in terms of e-health development. Let me tell you that among other things, well, the key achievement would be its scale up to almost all the country. As of today, the e-health was joined by more than 3,000 healthcare institutions all over Ukraine and more than 1,000 pharmacies and drugstores all over the country. Appropriately, it allows having, well, how to put it right. It allows having a good understanding at least. And as of today, this uh, would be institutions which have an agreement with the National Health System of Ukraine. Uh, which performs uh, the um, uh, procurement uh, or curates um, and uh, overlooks the procurement of medicines. And actually, this is our goal to have as many healthcare institutions, HCIs, do, uh, joining eHealth as possible. And we are doing our best to get the maximum amount of data, primary medical data, which is going to be used by various users of eHealth system. And in the first place, the key user of the system as of today uh, would be a patient. We are working and we are doing this for the patient since 2018. 
the system um, changed a lot and it became a full-fledged system covering all the country with we started small with the registration of one physician uh, with the registration of first healthcare institution and signing of a declaration with a physician and now we've reached great heights so to say we have plenty of medical data and on every patient who is visiting a physician uh, we see all the medical data in the e-health system with this electronic health information system the electronic health records are kept there and it means that each history of the interaction of the patients with the doctors would be preserved and would be saved for further interactions the data won't be lost the data won't be destroyed if those are hard copies and they won't be lost for the doctors as the users of the e-health system these are the new approaches to work and uh, of course uh, there will be some uh, paper uh, forms to be filled out and some information will have uh, to uh, be entered into uh, the electronic system but uh, in the uh, e-health system you will be able uh, to access uh, data multiple times and that is supposed to simplify the workflow for the doctors in the whole country, as mentioned, uh, the e-health system is scaled up uh, to the whole country. And we are able to see the uh, real-time updated information on uh, certain uh, diseases and on the number of uh, cases of uh, diseases uh, in uh, different regions. And also we see disaggregation by age and also and ge geographical spread. Speaking in uh, terms of figures, as of now, uh, the e-health system has already over 31 million patients registered. And for one year of uh, work of uh, electronic health records system, about 20 million patients uh, are there and uh, doctors already have electronic health records for them. Each interaction with a doctor, be it uh, the consult uh, that is sought by a patient or uh, certain examinations or lab tests uh, that are run are registered in the electronic health records and are saved uh, for uh, the lifetime and uh, the doctors uh, will be able uh, to draw the uh, medical conclusions and uh, speaking about the whole country, it is very important uh, for the process of the decision making, especially if we are speaking on behalf of the National Health Service of Ukraine. We need this kind of data to do the proper projections uh, for the amount of healthcare services that are to be paid for by the National Health uh, Service of Ukraine. And based on these data, we'll be able uh, to make accurate projections uh, that would be true and we know that the former system of the state statistics uh, sometimes showed the data that were very much different from the real data speaking in the terms of figures even more for 20 million patients uh, the electronic health records have already been entered uh, to e-health system and it also means that uh, these a uh, ehrs uh, already have uh, 250 million of various entries uh, the information about uh, medical procedures about examinations and tests and this kind of data could be used by the ministry of healthcare and other decision makers these data are depersonalized and we know that anyone could access uh, this kind of data in the format of as uh, the open source uh, panel dashboards uh, for the um, healthcare ministry. There are about 30 dashboards over there with the various types of information being present there. We are trying to make this data 
as open source data being accessible for the analysis and also for the sake of analytics and uh, the use for analytical reports. Of course, there is still room for growth and we keep on uh, working on the quality of data. We are improving it constantly. We hope that uh, these data could become even clearer and more reliable. Thank you, Dmitro. My congratulations. And um, as you were saying all these numbers, I kept thinking of the how fast it developed and um, the data that you are producing and actually making it open for decision making. Uh, now, I would like to ask Rita, from your broad international perspective and depths of understanding, what are some best practices in strengthening governance of e-health systems, especially in decentralized settings like Ukraine? Hmm. So um, as we think of governing a country's e-health ecosystem, regardless of health system structure, uh, the primary objective becomes how can e-health be governed to ensure access to health, high quality data for the continuity of patient care and overall patient health. So within the context of governance for e-health, we may want to ask a number of questions. For one, um, is there a well-structured governance system that clearly outlines the e-health management and implementation responsibilities of different entities and of different levels of the health system from the central to regional and sub-regional levels? And um, are the right stakeholders from the health sector involved? I heard earlier, you know, there are many efforts that have been multi-stakeholder in, in Ukraine. So, you, you know, you, you oftentimes countries like Ukraine have to decide, are the right stakeholders involved? You know, is the ICT sector or related sectors, are they involved? Um, another question to ask is, are there strategies, policies, and standard operating procedures in place to guide e-health implementation specifically? Uh, adequate investments in digital infrastructure being prioritized to encourage e-health maturity. Are global and especially regional e-health best practices, standards, and policies being considered? Uh, in Ukraine's case, standards from the European Union. Um, and, um, and lastly, is, is e-health being prioritized for the right things in the health sector? Every country has different priority health issues. And um, these questions are all tied to best practices. Um, one important mechanism that uh, ensures these questions are addressed or at least considered um, is an e-health strategy, um, first and foremost. Um, and what's important about an e-health strategy is it helps to outline the delegation of authority across government stakeholders in an e-health governance um, 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 uh, context. For example, uh, in decentralized health systems, it's very important to have clarity on who is responsible for e-health policy development and enforcement versus e-health implementation at each tier of the health system, at, you know, at central, regional, and sub-regional level. And um, an e-health strategy also outlines what enterprise architecture building blocks are needed to help a country's e-health infrastructure mature, such as what e-health framework should be followed and what standards of data privacy and health information systems interoperability, interoperability needs to be used, right? And if an e-health strategy is enforced through action plans, this also ensures that it will be focused on supporting a country's most important health issues, like I mentioned before. So, um, you know, from RTI's experience working with um, other countries, to develop uh, their e-health strategies, um, sometimes in collaboration with the WHO ITU, which um, has a number of um, uh, guidance, uh, you know, principles and you know their toolkit to support e-health strategy. What we have learned is it's important to be deliberate about establishing a plan 
and a process for monitoring a country's progress towards e-health maturity. Um, so not to just have an e-health strategy or an action plan, but a way to measure or monitor progress. And um, I'm aware that uh, Ukraine had its e-health strategy approved in 2020 and um, an e-health action plan um, uh, exists focused on e-health care system standards, uh, you know, audits. Um, uh, in, and uh, this is a good sign of best practices being followed um, in Ukraine and, and an example, um, I would say. So I'll end on that note, but um, ultimately there are a number of questions that you typically ask. And um, one key and foundational best practice is the establishment of an e-health strategy. Um, thank you, Rita. Uh, thank you very much. And I think it gives us a very good connection and vision um, of, through your recommendations and the um, national uh, health e-health strategy that has been approved a few months ago. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Mr. Kvitashvili, and based on your experience in the region, what are some similarities between Ukraine's country current health efforts and those of your of our neighbors? Um, and specifically, what are some governance challenges that Ukraine can effectively prepare or address based on regional experiences e health systems? Um, thank you, Victoria, and thank you for inviting me for this such an interesting event. Um, I'm glad to be here, and uh, I would like to start with a few remarks about the leap, uh, uh, enormous leap that Ukrainian uh, healthcare system has done in developing uh, e-health. And I do agree with Deputy Minister that last year was critical, and I think you did an extremely great job in moving uh, forward from from a pretty much dead end uh, last year, where where the system stood, and. Um, I think uh, this is a backbone of, of a properly functioning health system in general. Um, uh, Dimitro mentioned uh, statistics. This is the biggest issue that the country has. And with the e-health systems, both from the consumer-based applications and also the information that the ministry and the National Health Agency are uh, collecting through uh, the electronic data systems, uh, will be critical to uh, fix the issues with statistics, with proper uh, reporting of cases and treatment so we can uh, monitor how uh, uh, things are managed in general. Uh, that's from the actual uh, curative side. And it is important that we know that we are using the, the evidence-based methods, we're using the modern methods in, in, the, uh, in the country, and e-health is one of the biggest tools uh, for that. Not only that, it's also uh, an important, maybe one of the, if not the only important tool for uh, better managing and better planning financial planning. And as you know, that we've been doing uh, uh, planning based on the Samasco model on, on number of beds in the country. And now we're switching to, and we're in the process of switching to uh, pay for uh, service model. Uh, in this particular case, future planning of the budget is extremely important. As for the regional development, every country has chosen its own path. And i um, never, never been a proponent of uh, uh, taking something and copying uh, without, uh, you know, uh, considering local uh, specifics. Ukraine is a big country. Ukraine has an extremely well-developed IT sector in, in general. Uh, there are, there's no lack of specialists and there's no lack of professionals in here. And those of us that live here, uh, we use uh, IT products daily. And, and I think uh, anywhere I've been, this is probably the most advanced country. Um, as for the uh, path and the policy that has been chosen for e-health development, the biggest challenge, I believe, in Ukraine is bureaucracy. Uh, and that still is an issue to me because uh, decisions are, uh, uh, it takes too much time to make decisions, especially if there's a parliament involved in it in one way or another. Executive power of health or national health agency, they do not have... Uh, um, much room for maneuver. And I think uh, that really, really slows down things because these are the people that know the best what needs to be done. And once uh, these uh, types of issues are brought up to a, a large public discussion, and I do believe in representative democracy, I'm not against that. I'm just saying that uh, sometimes that turns into, into a very long bureaucratic process because 
uh, the developers of e-health and, and the roots of it were, were planted long time ago, maybe five, six years ago, as you well remember, Victoria, back then. Uh, but it, it took us a long time to actually get where we are. And again, I mean, last year was critical uh, in making a huge jump forward. Uh, and final note, uh, with, the, uh, with the regional development, Ukraine is part of Europe and European society. It has to be integrated. Uh, in the larger group, and the day will come when, uh, when Ukraine will become uh, soon, I hope, then later, sooner than later, part of the European family. And we have to be ready to be part, to be able to integrate into different systems, including including uh, uh, e-health systems that that uh, unify Europe. It's not just uh, for the sake of of uh, better treatment for patients, but also, I know, from from let's say EMEA, the the uh, European Medical uh, Agency, to other uh, governing bodies that are uh working in, in in the european union so i think uh there is a definite progress there is no question about it there's a very well functioning systems but you know there could be a lot of arguments whether it should be more concentrated on this side or more data collection less data collection i don't know this this is up for debate but um it is a fact that ukraine has tackled a very big issue and i think uh, the country is going very well forward and congratulate the team at the ministry and the national health agency that that has uh, been accomplished so far thank you thank you thank you um using the opportunity i would let before i move on to my next question to the deputy minister there is a question right um on the e-health development strategy um coming from paola pavlenko and um if i may um ask you to talk a little bit about the plans for the development of the action plan um, for the implementation of the e-health development strategy that was approved um, in December last so, year. And then um, the, I will go to the next question. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I was really inspired about the previous speaker, Mr. Akvitashvili. As a minister, he knows how, how much talking was in the Ministry uh, of Health how much how, how how many people like to talk about all the things that they didn't understood how it can correctly work so thank you for that um, about the action plan uh, that's exactly very important thing for us and uh, right now the action plan is currently being reviewed by the government uh, once it's approved we go uh, we'll go full speed and uh, continue our development but uh, our plan uh, is to do to do that maybe in two or three months uh, actually, uh, all the documents are sent from the ministry. Uh, we have some bureaucratic issues because um, uh, right now we are working uh, in a digital vaccination certificate. And uh, Mr. Kvitoshvili mentioned about connection to the uh, European e-health system. It's not uh, in every European country that it's not the system that they use in every country. It's not connected. But the digital vaccination certificate uh, will be one of the first steps of this connection. And Ukraine is on the edge of this movement because we did a great job with our colleagues from NHSU, with the Ministry of Digital Transformation. And uh, I hope we will get exactly the same uh, service as Europeans uh, will have in their countries. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Deputy Minister. Um, speaking along the lines, um, the MOH has led the legislative and regulatory regulatory efforts to kickstart this reform and e-health development. And we know that reforms are, as you said, iterative process when you have several steps and several bureaucracy moments to address. What do you think are the next policies and regulatory initiatives that you will be undertaking to further support and strengthen e-health system beyond the national um, action plan? Oh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good question exactly because uh, like not every week, but every month we add some things without uh, with working and uh, our registries that we have in the e-health, for example, we have a, a, a blood registry, so we need to add some things to fix the working of this uh, registry. But uh, for me, the most uh, thing I, need, I want to finish is to finish the adoption of concept of a uh, uh, adoption of a action plan of a digital health concept because we are speaking not about a digital uh, digital health system that we are talking about we are speaking about the whole uh, digital health because it's it's not only about our medical information system it's not about our health it's a more serious question uh, I, as I, as I mentioned before I want to finish with this and um, I want to 
say some words about it uh, because we had a working group with more than 40 people. Uh, that, uh, it was a very serious job because getting uh, everyone to agree with the one document as you, as you could expect wasn't an easy task. And uh, for now, we, we had the expert, we have expert, we had donors, we have our colleagues from NHSU, we have our colleagues from the cabinet office, from the Ministry of Digital Transformation. We got a lot of experts who are working with the ministry for many, many years, and they had a, a different opinion. But, but the, now we have this document. For the next steps, uh, I would like to work about. Um, uh, capacity and in increasing the capacity of a government company digital health uh, for a potential a full support of the system in future. Uh, I think we need to discuss with our colleagues, with uh, our experts and with our maybe society, maybe, uh, that the um, um, Ministry of Health should be the full owner of the system. Maybe, maybe we need to delay the development things uh, and the uh, things of accounting that uh, let's work with NHSU. NHSU did a great job with, uh, with, with the system, but we need to go forward. Maybe we can uh, choose our way of development with our architecture committee that we have mentioned in our e-health concept, maybe, but we need to move fast and we need uh, to have a small amount of people who, are, uh, who will in charge of the main decisions. Uh, I'm maybe done with this question. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, I would like to turn back to Dmitro um, and say, as Ukraine's e-health e -health system has made great strides in the last three years, the next step would be better integrating the quality in it. Um, what are the some strategies that you're exploring as NHSU to address that issue? Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, the time. Thank you for this question. Well, speaking about, well, and uh, responding your first question or first part of your question uh, when I was telling you about the achievements right so this is like a logical continuation of answering that very first question so after we we've gained all these achievements and after we received all these great numbers you've mentioned great steps uh, made forward the next uh, very important goal in the development of e-health in ukraine would be actually um, uh, to understand in what way to keep this data relevant, in what way to exchange this data with other systems. And here we have to speak about two um, things. The system within Ukraine, uh, because these systems will enable us having all the data in the e-system well updated and relevant and the second plane would be integrating ukrainian e-health to the uh, e-health systems of other countries if to speak about architectural peculiarities and standards uh, of e-health used in ukraine that's for example standard of uh, hl7 uh, version 5 that's the standard of exchanging information and actually it uh, this uh, standard of information exchange was uh, selected uh, as the uh, um, best one in Ukraine, and it will ensure interoperability of uh, data of the systems and us going to international arena with this. And actually, when developing e-health, we were using well-structured information, and this information is structured according to the international classifiers. We are using ICD classifier, for example, for primary data, ICD-10, for example, Archie, and all this means that the data collected by us and 
which are contained in some private systems inside the country and the systems outside Ukraine will be accessible. There will be opportunity to exchange this data and information and we will be actually accumulating this information for our benefits. The task of our service, the National Health Service of Ukraine, as I have already mentioned, would be to uh, always keep this data relevant and updated and we try to have proper exchange of information with uh, not only medical systems of Ukraine. For example, we are tracking down information about and we are verifying information that that's an actual physical patient that he or she is alive and we are using some official data to actually track uh, information whether these people are not already deceased and we are also we also have the monitoring function and monitoring is performed in various ways using various approaches this would be a routine monitoring and uh, sometimes we can arrange a visit to the healthcare institution also an automatic monitoring because we understand we are speaking about these big numbers and uh, uh, dozens of millions of entries and it's very difficult to verify them all and sometimes it's impossible which is why the automatic monitoring is used uh, uh, alongside with various algorithms and uh, clinical monitoring of course we are involving clinicists to identify certain patterns and they are helping uh, us out to track the behavior of uh, services providers and they help us identifying possible ill intentions maybe to even introduce some misinformation into the system and they help us preventing some uh, errors and mistakes including human error because sometimes uh, uh, data which is not relevant can be introduced into the system maybe due to negligence and we are trying to do our best, as mentioned, to have the most relevant and updated data. So we are checking also not just patients, but physicians. So we are verifying that uh, these are actual physicians, they have signed the contracts with uh, HCIs and uh, that they uh, were not fired, etc. And actually, we are also monitoring healthcare institutions. The, all of them are registered in the registries of Ministry of Justice. Maybe some of them are at the rim of bankruptcy. We are checking their licenses for various types of medical practice. And quite often, it's quite unexpected for healthcare institutions when we're informing them you ran out of your license you cannot do this and that and they are genuinely surprised so actually the national health system won't be paying you or reimbursing you for the services you're providing because you don't have a right to provide the services and this installs certain discipline within healthcare institutions this discipline so to say um physicians doctors because previously we didn't have the serious approaches as we have now and actually we face a certain resistance on the side of medical services providers but we are doing our best actually to have it all uh, on a proper level we need to have proper operation of the healthcare institutions and we need to have high quality data to exchange this data later on with other institutions within ukraine and beyond we are working with international uh, organizations and we are actually checking whether our systems are interoperable uh, 
Well, so far we don't have any trans-border exchange, but still, as Mr. Kvitashvili mentioned, the first experience uh, will be this um, uh, electronic vaccination certificate or digital vaccination certificate. We are having a look at the key requirements of the European Union, WHO, in order to understand what are their requirements for us to stick to these requirements and for us to develop a proper, a high quality certificate, which is going to be recognized in other countries as well. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to invite Rita to reflect um, on Dimitro's um, comments and um, tell us what are some key considerations that Ukraine should think about when it comes to establishing different standards of healthcare data exchange. Dimitro was referring to, and some of us are not necessarily the technical experts, but um, in general to understand what should be um, kept in mind and addressed. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Victoria. And I have to say, unfortunately, my translation um, was not working. And I think I missed some very important points um, related to standards. But I, I do think this uh, is still relevant. Um, what I will share is still relevant. So um, uh, something uh, that COVID-19 uh, has taught us, whether we're operating in low resources settings or highly digitized settings, is um, we're more effective when we're able to share data between clinics, whether public or private, um, with uh, the public health sector, and um, of course, across borders, even most importantly. And um, prioritizing data exchange solutions that have shown success in these areas is important. Um, uh, for Ukraine, uh, prioritizing regional e-health interoperability solutions, I think is something I do want to, to raise uh, to ensure uh, data exchange with neighboring European Union countries and, and others is uh, like, you know, is, is prioritized. And I know previous speakers have mentioned examples of um, this already happening, for example, with uh, the vaccination system, I think that was mentioned earlier. And um, I'm, I've also been made aware of the EU for Digital initiative, uh, which is uh, aiming to meet um, the EU digital health and care priorities um, um, with EAP countries as well. Um, so, you know, with you, Ukraine adopting um, some of these regional standards as well as um, uh, standards such as the FIRE data exchange um, standard, which is a viable and popular global standard. Um, I, I would say, um, you know, if anything, I would emphasize that um, uh, these are examples, or this is an example of Ukraine going in the right direction. That stated, um, data exchange is most efficient when it's guided by a health information exchange framework. Um, you know, a good health information exchange framework typically incorporates uh, three things. Um, number one is a business domain and registry service component. Um, the business service, uh, the business domain piece is, um, you know, technologies that offer specific uh, health, support specific health services such as, say, a logistics management information system for medical and drug supply distribution or a finance and insurance service system. And then a registry technology components um, allow the tracking of unique patient data, uh, facility data, or you know, health data, uh, product data across the health system. Um, you know, and, 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 and registries typically also bring together terminology standards used across the health system. Um, okay, and um, so that, that's one component of a health information exchange. And then you have a second component, which uh, is what's called an interoperability layer for the less technical people uh, in the audience. This uh, interoperability layer facilitates the secure transfer of data between the business services and the registries I was referring to earlier. Um, and then the, the third tier um, are the familiar point of service systems 
that are exposed at the clinical you know, level. Um, and these include electronic health record systems um, or the MIS systems in Ukraine, I believe. Um, so, you know, I, I advocate for a health information exchange, um, regardless of the structure of the country's health system. You know, and in Ukraine's case, I understand um, that perhaps the solution is, is um, multiple exchanges, but ultimately feeding data into one central um, area. Um, but, um, uh, you know, all, all that said, I, I will share that RTI's work um, with um, some global health informatics communities of practice where we've developed functional requirements for the components I just mentioned earlier in the health, inform exchange, health information exchange. Um, um, through that work, we learned that uh, it's important to ensure that these components, the three different components I, I shared, um, follow standard requirements. Um, so that, you know, when they're built, they're built in the right way to, to offer optimal data exchange. And um, part of that, I'll circle back, is, you know, by ensuring, um, for example, uh, global standards that are, you know, have, have proven um, success uh, uh, are, are, are considered, just like the fire data exchange standard that I heard mentioned earlier. Thank you, thank you, Rita. Um, and we actually have uh, quite a few questions that we will try to address, but I would like to turn now to Sandra um, and ask um, what I would consider potentially a practical question on how can Ukraine leverage its data for making evidence-based decisions? Uh, because as um, Dmitro uh, presented, NHSU is indeed producing quite large amount of data that is um, open and can be analyzed. There is a lot of data that also can be used for uh, decision making. So can you please reflect on that? And we'll try to address some questions. Sure, I'll try. I actually glanced um, on, on the Q&A uh, part and there's a question about that. When will this data be available? Um, well, the aggregated data, which is now being collected by um, the National Health Services and uh, the Ministry of Health, needs to be sorted, uh, uh, analyzed, and, and, and batches of data have to be produced. This is a very lengthy process. It's not an easy, uh, uh, easy one-click uh, solution to it, unfortunately. But uh, over the time, and you have to keep in mind that we are collecting information, it's not in full, only for less than a year. So, you know, if we're looking at the statistics and if you want our um, decisions to be based on evidence and evidence within the country and how uh, patients are treated, uh, it will take some time for that to, for the aggregated data to be sorted and to be used in, in practical terms. It's not just that, it's not the practices how people are treated, but also what are the patterns of, um, uh, of uh, pharmaceutical consumption, what are uh, prescriptions, what are we prescribing, in what quantities, in what qualities. Uh, this is a big issue in, in, in the former Soviet Union over prescription of antibiotics. So the e-health system uh, data which is being collected now will definitely be uh, paramount for, for, for uh, adjusting protocols uh, could be or could be um, the, the treatment protocols and, and other guidelines. But uh, it just doesn't happen uh, at a very quick pace. It will take time and I would say maybe uh, after a year and a half or two years of aggregation of data, then, then we will have uh, the ability to analyze it and then use it in practical terms. However, at this point, we can use the data for better planning, for, for better financing of the healthcare, uh, and more we get, uh, more we'll be able to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it in part um, answers the question from uh, one of our audience members um, regarding when data on treated cases, morbidity, outpatient and inpatient will be available for e-health for mach machine processing. Um, if there is um, panelists are seeing the questions, if there is an urge to answer, otherwise we'll try to address them in Britain. Um, and as we have two minutes left, um, um, any closure or comments from 
Mr. Kutcher from Dmitro, from Sandra. It, um, and as we conclude our discussion today, I'd like to thank you, our panelists and our participants and the teams um, at both RTI and IRF who helped us organize this. Uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation about expanding e-health in Ukraine and in the future. Uh, we will be emailing you the recording of this session within the next week or so. And then, until then, be well, take care and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for a great Thank discussion. You. Have a nice day. Thank you.